For with thee is merciful forgiveness. Words taken from today's tract for Septuagesima Sunday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lady, as we know, followed our dearest Lord along the way of the cross, all the way up to Calvary. There are also, the Bible records, other holy women along that Via Dolorosa, that way of sorrows. And one of these other holy women waited for a chance to show some act of kindness, to give some relief, however small, to the Lord's sufferings. The soldiers that drove our Lord onward on that journey showed no kindness towards the crowd that followed Jesus. In fact, those guards would have verbally abused individuals and even struck anyone who sought to slow the ascent to Golgotha. And yet this holy woman kept following. Our Lord then fell upon the ground. And while the soldiers began to flog him, to beat him back to his feet, that woman saw her chance. Moved with compassion, she ran up and offered her veil to our Lord so that he might wipe his most holy face of blood and spittle. And as we know from tradition, that woman was named Veronica. The image of his holy face was subsequently and miraculously imprinted upon that very veil. Veronica's veil, which wiped our Lord's sacred countenance, is presently at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and is considered one of the most treasured relics in the church today. But who was this woman, this woman named Veronica? And how did she know our Lord? And why was she moved to show him such compassion? A tradition states that St. Veronica was actually the woman whom Christ cured of that issue of blood. You know, that woman of scriptures who had suffered from hemorrhaging for 12 years, a condition that no natural doctor was able to cure. But the divine physician completely cured her when Veronica simply touched the hem of Christ's garment. Veronica is also identified as King Herod the Great's niece. The church celebrates the feast of St. Veronica on July 12th each year. Now, no one is certain what might have happened to Veronica in her later years, though one story has it that she cured the Roman Emperor Tiberius of a most serious illness using, again, her iconic veil, Veronica's veil. Some sources say that she and her husband eventually traveled all the way to southern France and would have joined Saints Lazarus, Martha, and Mary Magdalene in confessing the gospel of Christ. But now let us go forward a little bit in time and consider a special private revelation of our dearest Lord to a French Carmelite nun in the 19th century. Now, private revelations are not additions to apostolic teachings. There are no new truths. Rather, private revelations are heaven-sent messages that promote devotions to help us live out the unchanging faith in our lives, including receiving even warnings about future dangers to the church militant and even to the world. Now, in the 1840s, a Carmelite nun named Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre saw a vision of Veronica. Saint Veronica from the Stations of the Cross, wiping away the spit and mud and blood from the face of our Lord with her veil on the way to Calvary. Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre was then told that the sacrilegious and blasphemous acts committed in her day were adding to the spittle and mud that Saint Veronica wiped away on Good Friday. And so our Lord told the good nun the following. This is something to remember. I want new Veronicas. I desire new Veronicas to wipe and venerate my divine face, which has so few adorers. The first message of our dearest Lord was actually given to Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre on August 26th, 
in the year 1843, just one day after the great feast of St. Louis IX, Holy King of France, and yes, a crusader not just against the Muslims, but a crusader against blasphemy. He despised blasphemy. St. Louis IX once stated that the best way to deal with the person who insulted or cursed or mocked God was to run him through with a sword. The Savior stated that, quote, blasphemy was a frightful sin that wounds his heart more grievously than any other sins, unquote. With blasphemy, the sinner curses Christ to his face, attacks him publicly, rejects salvation, and pronounces his own judgment. Our dear Lord then added that mankind's unwillingness to respect his holy name and to cast insults and blasphemies towards the Most High were like what he called poison arrows that were striking him regularly. This is why our dearest Lord gave to Sister Marie de St. Pierre the famous golden arrow prayer, a prayer that is lovingly aimed towards the Son of God, like gentle arrows that wound him delightfully, thus healing the wounds inflicted by blasphemers. In a later revelation, Christ came to that Carmelite sister and told her another thing that caused him great pain, namely profaning and abusing the Lord's day. The focus is on the first three commandments too. Don't forget the first three. Our Lord said the following. This is a striking phrase. Our Lord said, the Jews crucified me on Friday, but Christians crucify me on Sundays. They crucify him on Sunday because they're violating the third commandment. Sister Marie Saint Saint Pierre was also told by our Lord to receive Holy Communion every Sunday with the intention of making atonement for all forbidden Sunday labor. Appeasing, that's an important word, appeasing the divine justice that was on the verge of punishing France for the sin of profaning Sundays and to beg the conversion of those sinners who desecrated Sundays. All these public attacks upon the Holy Name, upon the Lord's Day, as well as public attacks against the true religion and the Roman Church were adding up and would soon submerge the world in the wrath of God unless reparation were done. The Son of God then spoke of his anger. The anger he felt towards those men who ignore or reject those first three commandments. Not just four through ten. The first three that have to do with God. And they were something that our Lord wished to correct. Our Lord stated to Sister Marie de St. Pierre, quote, The earth is covered with crimes. The violation of the first three commandments has irritated my heavenly Father. The holy name of God is blasphemed. The holy day of the Lord's Sunday is profaned. These sins have risen up unto the throne of God and provoked his wrath and will soon burst forth if his justice is not appeased. Unquote. This is an appeal. But our Lord later added that the chastisement he would send to punish the world for its blasphemy its violations of the ways of keeping Sunday properly, the chastisement he would send to punish the world would not necessarily be natural disasters, not necessarily earthquakes or hurricanes or other sorts of natural disasters. No, he said the punishment would come in the form of, quote, the malice of revolutionary men, unquote. That's the punishment. The malice of revolutionary men, also known at that time as the communists. The ultimate revolutionary liberals. Sister Marie de St. Pierre received these revelations between 1843 and 1848. And it just so happens that Karl Marx would publish his communist manifesto at the same time, 1848. Our Lord is always one step ahead. And is there any doubt in our minds as we 
look around the world over the last century and a half, is there any doubt in our minds that this punishment has and continues to be inflicted upon us because of the public crimes against the rights of God in the Western world? Russia has spread her errors. Therefore, the world suffers greatly because of the malice of revolutionary men. Public blasphemy, public mockery, public insults towards the good Lord, and attacks upon his mystical body demand public reparation be made. Public. Our blessed Lord again spoke to Sister Marie de St. Pierre, stating that, quote, the Son of God comes as an ambassador. I come as an ambassador to you to urge us to make reparation in order that he may honor his Father. If this is not done, our Lord warns, if irreverence and impiety continue, if we neglect his terms of peace as an ambassador, the Son of God threatens to declare war upon man by grave punishments. That's a serious threat coming forth from the ambassador who wishes to give us peace. In our modern day, people are always talking about rights, human rights, ad nauseum, all about my rights, my rights. In all the talk about this notion of rights, no one ever mentions God's rights that God has rights too. In fact, in the modern world, it seems that the so-called rights of man trump, trump the very rights of God. When prayer is forbidden in public, God's just claim to be worshipped by his creatures overturned by mere human courts. The removal of scenes, nativity scenes, crucifixes, or Ten Commandment monuments from public squares? Is it a criminal attempt to remove the good Lord from the public square itself when he in fact created everything that is on this earth? When human courts and human judges claim a right to split marriages apart or even to, dear Lord, redefine marriage before our very eyes, they're directly going against the rights of the Son of God, the creator of marriage. God has a right, it is a right, which he has a just claim to make, to have one day of the week at least, which is his special day of worship and rest from any unnecessary labor or unnecessary commercial activity. And God has a holy name, a name that is above every other name, and he has a right not to have his name abused with coarse or especially blasphemous language. And it ought to be noted that God also has a right to have his Christ, his anointed one, his only son recognized and acknowledged as the ultimate Lord of creation, that he is rightfully ruler and king of the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. Every village, every town, every city, state, country, and continent is duty-bound to accept the order which God has established with his Christ, his only Son, as the way, and his gospel as the foundation for any true, healthy society of men. Christ has the right to claim such an exalted position over all creation because of who he is, literally, the Son of the God come in the flesh, divinity become man. And yes, he also has the right just claim to demand our allegiance due to the fact that he shed his blood for every single one of us and all creatures on earth. We belong to him. He purchased us at a price. Now, I could go on with many further examples of the rights that God has. But for now, let us attend to our Lord's appeal. This can be solved. He wants new Veronicas. New Veronicas, believers who are willing to make repairs, reparation. Reparations not to various activist groups that seek to fill their pockets with money. No, no, no. Reparation offered to an offended God. 
to make repairs for all the ingratitude of men by being ever more grateful, simply to love him. That's the best act of reparation of all. Consoling our dearest Lord, who has so few loyal friends in this disloyal age. In this Septuagesima season, which we have begun today, that prepares us for Lent, let us do this work in the vineyard. Our Lord wants us to work in the vineyard. And part of that work, let it be reparation to that heart that has loved men so much, to that blood that has been shed for our sins, and to that holy face, which is literally the face of God come in the flesh. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.